Today on At the Forefront, we'll discuss music and health. We'll share how clinicians, musicians, and public health leaders are using music and concerts as a tool to improve health education. That's coming up right now on At the Forefront. And we want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. Let's start off by having you introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about what you do here at uh, U Chicago Medicine. Well, thanks for having me on your show. My name is Benjamin Levy, and I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Chicago. You have a very, uh, uh, I think, very interesting take on music and health and medicine. And we're going to delve into that a little bit uh, during the course of the show. But I want to start off, if you can tell us a little bit about your background and why you're so interested in music. Sure. Well, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, and started piano in early age in second grade, and then added cello in fourth grade and I became extremely passionate about music and was very lucky to be exposed to the Savannah Symphony Orchestra. And when I went to college, I actually ended up becoming a music major at yeah. the University of Virginia. And then I was lucky enough to receive a Fulbright Fellowship to continue doing research in Paris uh, after college, but before medical school. And I've just always been super passionate about music, but it was during college at UVA that I really started diving into organizing concerts and trying to introduce new audiences to new kinds of music. And I actually started a concert series there. And I also organized an international conference on music suppressed by the Third Reich and did a fundraising concert with the president of the University of Virginia to try to fundraise money to build a new, perform new performing arts center there. Yeah, that's, that's really, really interesting. And so music has been a passion of yours your, your entire life. Yeah. Uh, you got interested in music interested in, in medicine as well. How did that uh, uh, come about? So I was always uh, interested in medicine. My grandfather passed away when I was nine years old of lung cancer. And from that moment on, I wanted to become a physician in order to help patients and their families get through difficult times and to hopefully extend people's lives. Uh, so I've been pre-med the entire time. It was actually at UVA that I decided to become a music major. They are the pre-med advisor encouraged everyone during orientation if there was something that we we're passionate about outside the sciences to think about majoring in it because at least at the time med schools loved to have a few students who are non-traditional majors interesting interesting so you managed to combine the two uh, over time and, and tell us how that, that 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 worked out yeah so when i was at emory emory university is right next door to the cdc and at that time actually it was across the street from the american cancer society and lots of medical students during their time at Emory Med School wanted to work with people from the CDC. And so they would either work on research projects or public health campaigns. And so I thought of the idea of trying to work with people from the CDC, but also to continue organizing concerts. I was kind of inspired by the rock band Queen, who at that time was organizing concerts with Nelson Mandela uh, in Africa. And they were trying to raise awareness about HIV prevention yeah. and to decrease the stigma around AIDS. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to organize concerts in the United States with music celebrities in order to teach the public about health and to work with people who are extremely involved with public health at Emory, at the CDC, and nationally? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's fascinating to, to kind of combine the two. And, and, and obviously you knew from, from the very beginning what a powerful tool music can be in a person's life, and, 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 but you took it a step further, it sounds like. Yeah, so initially uh, I actually wanted to organize a televised event that was centered around teaching people about health. And as I talked to more and more people, I realized that I should start off with a smaller goal. And so I actually started this project called Music Inspires Health with my best friend from college who had continued on. He had stayed at the University of Virginia. I had gone to Emory for med school. And we put together a 45 member national medical advisory board to help us with this project. And we organized rock and hip hop concerts around the country uh, in cities, including Atlanta, Washington, DC, Boston, New York, here in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, as well as in Los Angeles. And some of the people helping us included three previous CDC directors of HIV STD prevention, as well as the director of public health for Los Angeles County, the director of STD control for the state of California, and several medical school deans, including the deans at the University of Virginia and GW, 
Kaiser Permanente, which is a huge healthcare provider out in California, yeah. actually contacted us to see if they could get involved with their project when they heard about it because they were working, they were looking for projects that were involved with music and teaching about health. And they asked if, if we would be interested in having them become a sponsor of the concerts that they were in their cities. And so we welcomed them and I actually worked, it was an amazing experience. I actually worked with the director of event planning for all Kaiser Permanente on this project and uh, the, the Concert tour featured Ingrid Michelson and Trey Songs, who's a hip hop singer, uh, Ben Queller, a whole bunch of different artists. And it, it was an amazing program, but we went to LA and filmed health education short films with young directors there, which was a great experience. The, the tour focused on HIV, STD prevention, exercise, uh, nutrition, um, encouraging the public uh, to exercise. Uh, it was aimed at adolescents, college students, and young adults. Um, but we also talked about depression awareness and eating disorder awareness. And uh, it was an amazing uh, campaign. We organized all these concerts during a tour in 2008. Uh, that's, that's, that's incredible. And, you know, it's funny because we were talking a little bit about this before the program. I met you, it's been a few weeks ago now, uh, you were working on another project and you were talking about um, uh, some of the work you'd done with music and, and health and it just was was fascinating to me and I asked you to come and do this because I just think it's so interesting and also I think it's it's certainly it has value one of the things you mentioned because you were trying to I guess teach other physicians a little bit about the power of music with health um, is is being able to kind of measure the good that you do and I know there's a lot going on uh, kind of behind the scenes when you plan something like this but you want to make sure you reach a lot of people and you have an impact on people and, and a positive impact and that's obviously why you use some of the more popular uh, musicians of the day. Yeah, um, so the, what you're referring to, we were creating a video about health education campaigns using music uh, I was producing something uh, for Medscape to uh, reach out to the public and teach about uh, the new colon cancer screening age is 45. So part of the uh, project was to teach the public about that. But we were also teaching uh, physicians nationally uh, about the idea of using music and concerts to teach about health education. And it doesn't matter what topic. I'm, I'm super passionate now about colon cancer screening and really sure. getting the idea out there. Um, that people should start their colonoscopies at age 45. Um, but it can be used by cardiologists, it can mm -hmm. be used by psychiatrists to teach about depression awareness, it can be used to teach about eating uh, disorders, it can be used to teach about exercise and nutrition. And uh, so we wanted to, to expand our reach um, and not only have projects that are, that are created here at the University of Chicago, uh, but to give people the tools that they can start thinking about building health education campaigns in their local communities. Well, and it just makes sense because for years people have used music to sell things, uh, sell products on television, on the radio, online. And, and so there's, there's certainly a power there to, to really grab people's attention and, and their, their imagination. And so why not use it for something positive like health education? Yeah, and the cool thing about music, so it grabs people's attention. Our concerts that we've been organizing online are 90% entertainment so it's music performances and we kind of sprinkle it with health health education one of the cool things is the opportunity to work with music celebrities to teach them more about a topic that they feel passionate about so during that tour we taught them about hiv std prevention and helped them feel comfortable uh, we put together a bullet point list of uh, ideas for them to talk about and we practice in advance we also filmed health education short films uh, and we've used this in a variety of different ways. Um, so during the pandemic, actually, I started a virtual series called Concerts and Cocktails. I started with friends of mine who volunteer with me at the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. I was co-chair of their Sound Post series, which is organized by the Young Professional Board in order to get young people interested in uh, going to the Chicago Symphony concerts and introducing them to classical music sometimes for the first time ever. It's kind yeah. of set up like a lounge series. And um, so during the pandemic, this was in April of 2020, we thought of the idea of doing a virtual series because everyone was during the lockdown yeah. in their houses and musicians were just at home. And so we started reaching out to music uh, celebrities from different genres of music and asked them to record something for a virtual series 
they would team up music celebrities with physicians and nurses on the front lines in order to teach about physically distancing and how to wear masks properly. Because if you think yeah. back to that time period, you know, people wearing masks all over the place, they weren't covering their nose, that kind of thing. And uh, it was an incredible opportunity to give voice to, to physicians and nurses on the front lines nationally and have them teach the public about these important health topics. And then uh, I was asked to give a TEDx talk about um, this topic of building health education campaigns using um, music and concerts. And at that time, uh, the uh, president of the American College of Gastroenterology saw my TEDx talk when it was, screen when it was um, streamed live. Uh, the next day, wrote me and asked if I would be interested in organizing something similar for colon cancer awareness. And so hmm. for the past two years, we've been organizing these concerts during Colon Cancer Awareness Month, which is in March, uh, teaming up music celebrities uh, with gastroenterologists nationally and, and a couple of other celebrities such as Katie Couric, mm -hmm. uh, who has recorded PSAs for us both years. And it's yeah. been an incredible experience. And we've, we've been very lucky to uh, have a lot of support from music celebrities so um, over the past two years, we've featured Rufus Wainwright, Lisa Loeb, uh, Hilary Hahn, who's a really famous violinist, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, the Cincinnati Pops, uh, a lot of different artists. Uh, Carrie Ellis, who's a Broadway singer and a West End singer in London, um, contributed a song with Brian May, uh, the guitarist from Queen oh, this yeah. year. Uh, Tim Reynolds, who's a guitarist in the Dave Matthews Band, has contributed songs both years. And it's been a really, really, really cool project to work on. Yeah, it's, it sounds sounds just really, really fun. And, uh, you know, it's it's um, it, did you ever dream that it would take off like that? I mean, no. uh, people seem to really embrace it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was hoping that the first tour would kind of continue throughout my career and I would be able to use it in different ways. At that time, I actually didn't know what kind of position I was going to become. I was thinking about internal medicine just because it would prepare me to teach about different health topics. Um, uh, no matter which field I went into, yeah. but uh, I had no idea that it would take off like this. It was really that Concerts and Cocktails uh, series during the pandemic that over the past uh, two and a half years has spawned off a whole bunch of different health education projects, um, but they kind of build on top of each other and we yeah. kind of have a following now. Uh, and it's really, really cool, this concept of using music to teach about health because the audience latches on to it because of the entertainment value. And like I said before, it's kind of like the health education is sprinkled on. Also, one thing that I really wanted to do from the very beginning back in med school, and we continue having this idea that we don't want the health education topics to be lectures. We yeah. want them to be inspiring, empowering, and actually create behavioral lifestyle changes. And at that time, when we were teaching young people, we thought of ourselves kind of like an older sibling who could teach in a very positive way, but fun and, uh, you know, not lecture-like. Yeah, because it, it, it puts it in a, in a whole new light to, to a lot of people. And, and obviously, you, you try to reach a lot of youth with uh, some of the uh, acts and singers you have, but you also, you also try to reach folks that are, are a little bit more mature. Obviously, you know, colon cancer screening, that would be not necessarily young people. So... Um, it, you you, you kind of cover the entire age range. Yeah, and we did that on purpose. Yeah. Uh, so we wanted to reach people that would really resonate with uh, people age 45 and up, but also we wanted to reach younger audiences because a 40 year old is about to need a colonoscopy in five years. They also have parents, and this is the, the big thing that we try to do. We try to reach younger people so that they can encourage their parents and other people in their family and friends to get screened for colon cancer. Because yeah. frequently that's actually what flips people. People that are he hesitant to get a colonoscopy, uh, if they have a, a, a child that's encouraging them or uh, you know anyone else in their, their life that has been impacted by colon cancer, that's usually enough to convince someone to finally get a, a screening colonoscopy. Yeah. And uh, we would be naive in any of these projects to think that a one-off event would change behavior for everyone. So that's why it's important when we do these projects, it's not just this, we have a poster campaign for all these mm -hmm. projects. And just into that, we have a social media campaign online uh, for the Tune It Up concert that we organized with the American College of Gastrology. It's called Tune It Up, uh, a concert to raise colorectal cancer awareness. We actually got the help from SiriusXM 
and our doctor radio, uh, they have featured us for the past two years. And so, you know, the first year w- was so much fun. We, we did this project with Lisa Loeb on, yeah. on their radio show, uh, and she was live from her home. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to hit people in unique ways um, because it's, it's cumulative. You need to, to teach people in different ways over a long period of time in order to really change behaviors. So as you teach other physicians about this, what are some of the other uses of music for physicians? Well, first of all, uh, as musicians, we actually listen to music frequently when we do procedures. So when yeah. we do colonoscopies, uh, we listen to music and it helps patients when they're being sedated. It helps mm-hmm. relax them. What I love to do is ask patients what they, especially the patients that seem a little bit more nervous, yeah. uh, to ask them what kind of music they want to listen to uh, while they're getting their sedation and during their procedure. Uh, and it immediately puts them at ease. But also, if you talk to surgeons or gastroenterologists, it actually helps us to focus a lot and it puts us kind of like in the zone. Just like, you know, runners or swimmers <laughs> listen to music to pump them up before their big races. We do kind of the same thing. So then I'm going to ask, do you have walk-on music when you come into the, uh, the OR? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, some of our uh, techs and nurses do play music for us. Um, That's funny. Yeah, here uh, they, they control the music list and uh, you know, it allows us to focus on what, we, uh, what we're here to do. But uh, you know, they, they definitely put some of my, my favorites on. But in other ways, you know, throughout my training and starting at Emory, actually, I love the idea of bringing music into the hospital. And there are a lot of hospitals nationally that have um, music therapy programs, um, but it's not just to get people's heart rate down, their blood pressure under better control. Uh, it really puts patients at ease and it's, it serves as a distraction and it really minimizes patients' anxiety. Uh, and so I've been doing this. The first time I did it, I was actually on the heart failure service at Emory and uh, my team came up with the idea of me bringing my cello in to play for this patient who was in heart failure and hadn't been able to go home in over a month mm-hmm. um, in order to put them at ease. It was kind of close to the holidays. And then we thought of the idea of, why don't I bring my cello in uh, and start playing Christmas carols around Christmas? And so I've been doing that from med school, residency, fellowship, and now as a practicing physician. Um, over the holidays, I love bringing my cello and playing for patients, both in the ICU and the floors, but also uh, during residency, I started going to hospice and oh, playing yeah. for patients in hospice, yeah, and they love it. The first time we were discharging a patient, and uh, you know, it was around that time period where I was playing in the hospital, and I uh, thought of the idea, because it was a really, really nervous patient about leaving the hospital, he felt that um, you know, he wasn't gonna have a connection to the oncologist who had been taking care of him and wanted, he was apprehensive about leaving, but wanted to have a way to communicate with the hospital. Yeah. And so just during rounds, I came up with the idea, why don't I just volunteer and go check on him in two days and let him know before he leaves the hospital that if he's in any pain or discomfort or anything's going on, I can report back to the oncologist who are taking care of him at the University of Arizona where I went to residency. And the patient loved the idea. And, uh, and I said, as long as I'm there, like, why don't I come and play the cello for you? And uh, the, they loved that idea. And so when I was actually in the hospice, the hospice nurses just thought it was the greatest thing ever. Yeah. And so they started bringing me from room to room to room. And so I quickly realized the value of music. Um, and it's not just for the patients, it's for their families too. Yeah. You know, they've been so stressed out and they're just trying to have really quality time with their family members. And when you sit there with a patient um, who's dying of cancer in hospice and their family's there, it gives them a moment, even if it's just for two or three minutes, to block out everything in their lives, all their other thoughts, and just enjoy life for a moment. And uh, it's really, really, really special to to be able to share those experiences with patients and their families. It's an incredible talent and it's incredibly powerful. I, you know, I, I, here at uh, U Chicago Medicine, for for those uh, who are or those of you who are not familiar with where we are, uh, we actually have a big lobby up on the seventh floor of our our big hospital, our Center for Caring Discovery, and there's a piano in there, and and occasionally there will be musicians in there. And I'll never forget, there was a patient that we had that was a cancer patient, and uh, he was also a jazz pianist, and so he was he was playing the piano in there, and he was fantastic, and 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 
just the people that were gathering to listen. It was really a, a neat, neat moment. But it just, again, I think it just shows that it has such a power for people. It is. It's distracting. It, it allows people... In a good way. <laughs> yeah, it's distracting in a great way so that you don't focus on your sickness. No. And it, it allows you to feel normal again. And it allows the patients to bond with their family members. And, and you know, when I'm taking care of a patient too, it's even more powerful as a physician being able to, to bring joy to their life in a different way. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's been really, really cool. And there, there are a lot of physicians who do this. Um, I'm friends with a neurologist at Northwestern mm -hmm. who uh, does something very similar at Northwestern. And he's very involved with their music program and bringing music to patients' lives in the hospital. Uh, we were actually friends together in residency, uh, and I think we, we think about music in very similar ways. We're both passionate about classical music and other genres as well. Uh, and it's, it's such a cool way to bring music to people's lives. He actually uses music as a way, especially singing, as a way to help stroke patients who are having dysphagia hmm. um, and dysarthria um, problems. Um, dysarthria means trouble speaking. And uh, he uses singing as a way to retrain people how to speak. Uh, and, Interesting. You know, it's, it's really, really cool the research he's been doing with stroke and dysarthria patients. That's very interesting. So um, as we look towards the future, what kind of advances do you see in medicine involving music and, and the two intertwined? Well, hopefully there are other physicians out there as well as, uh, you know, people, public health experts from the CDC and the NIH and anyone who's designing health education campaigns uh, to use music as a tool to reach audiences, a broad audience. Uh, you know, one of the strengths of organizing programs like this is to reach a mainstream audience, but also vulnerable patient populations. And so it's important when we build these projects to make sure that we're having diversity in genres of music, but also in terms of, of, of race and, um, you know, really try to, to reach patient populations that might not be getting health education um, in uh, a high volume. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we should be working together with our public health experts. You know, you can't just design a program and just throw it out there. A lot of thought in all these projects we've done are formative research. It was cool during med school, actually. One of my med school friends, who's now a pediatric gastroenterologist at Emory, uh, but her dad was an executive at Coca-Cola. Hmm. And he worked with the travel in industry. Uh, and we were hanging out uh, one day, we're actually having a beer together. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was trying to advise me as I was building this first project. And he said, you know, you can't just throw something at the wall and, and expect it to stick. You really need to do your formative research. And that's what these big companies do when they're doing marketing campaigns. And so, uh, you know, during all these projects, we've done a lot of formative research through online surveys, through focus groups, through written surveys. Uh, and it's really, really important. So I encourage anyone who's thinking about building a similar campaign to really do your formative research and to surround yourself with public health leaders yep. or experts in this field who can look at a screenplay when you're going to, to LA to film a, a, a health education short film and make sure the information is extremely accurate, yep. but also work with health communication experts who are the best in this field to create empowering messages that are actually gonna create behavioral lifestyle changes over time. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just a, a fantastic effort. And uh, I'm so glad you, you agreed to do this today because I, I just think it's so interesting. And thank you very really much appreciate for having it. me. Yeah. It's fun. And keep spreading the good word. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time right now. I really uh, uh, appreciate uh, those of you who have uh, watched the program today. And of course, a big thank you to our doctor here today. Please remember to check out our Facebook page for our schedule of programs that are coming up in the future. To make an appointment, go online at uchicagomedicine.org or give us a call at 888-824-0200. Thanks again for being with us today, and I hope everyone has a great week.